I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I have a shoebox here, and a big batch of leftover dyes with, where I know what's in there, and then a smaller batch of some leftovers where I don't know what's in here. Except this looks more orangey red, and I have a feeling this is going to be very, very blue. <laughs> and I thought it would be fun to cold process some roving. This right here is Knit Picks Swish Roving, and... I am just adding this to my container. I'm not even, you know, I'll untie the ends. But otherwise, I'm not really moving it much. Uh, it's looped back and forth, it's just unfolded, and it fits nicely into my shoe box. I mean, I'm just gonna go for it. Now, the shoe box technique is really just using the shoe box as a dye vessel. I'm gonna set everything up cold, let this sit outside for at least overnight, maybe a couple days before coming back to heat set it. And the results can be really, really fun. And we may just end up with something tonal. Okay, I'm gonna transfer this into a different container so it's a little easier to pour. And, and I'm really just curious about the volume. So we have around 175 milliliters of this rust color. And this was leftovers from a few different projects. There may be acid in there, there may not, I don't know. Now in this bigger jar where I have over a liter, this is leftovers, I'm curious how dark it's gonna be. Ooh, it's a very pretty midnight blue. Uh, this has some Caribbean blue, some deep magenta, uh, there is some brilliant yellow, and sapphire blue. Maybe a hint of some dark navy. Now, I think that we have a fair amount of pigment here, and I have a feeling we may lose a lot of coverage here from that brown. But now I'm wondering if I should leave things to sit a little bit before I push things down, add water, add acid. I think I'm gonna do that. Uh, not super, super long, maybe just 15 minutes. So our fiber, which by the way, it's 100% superwash merino wool. I'll have an affiliate link in the video description if you wanna learn more about it. And there's plenty of liquid down at the bottom. I could easily push this in, pour water on top. But my thought is that if I let things sit, we might slowly soak up water. In fact, I see some water sort of wicking up the fiber in some areas, and maybe that'll give us some fun variation. I don't know. I mean, a superwash roving like this will absorb color a little bit faster. We could get some breaking. Uh, we could see some, I bet we would see some of the Caribbean blue spread, but I don't know what's gonna happen, and it's making me really, really excited. Oh my goodness. <gasps> Because is it just me or as I'm talking, are some of these areas getting wetter? I mean, I don't really want to do a time lapse, but I feel like, I feel like I see it. I see it the, moving up. Oh, especially like right there. I think I just watched it. <laughs> I mean, I could press everything down right now, but swish. Did I call this stroll roving? This is swish roving. Swish is very absorbent as a yarn line. I find that it soaks up water really, really easily, making it really easy to play around with when it is dry. But I don't really know what to expect here. And I am vamping a little bit because I'm curious if while I'm talking, things are gonna change. Okay, but instead, there's 13 minutes left on my timer. I'll be back in, after those 13 minutes and you'll be able to see more dramatically how things are, differ from how they are right now. Yeah, maybe there's not that much change. I'm not reviewing the footage, but the timer just went off and now I get to touch. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited about this. All right, remember how I said I had no acid in here? I mean, at least I thought there was no acid. All right, we're definitely seeing breaking. We're getting this like cool slate green. Interesting. I wonder how much the brown, I see some over there. I wonder how much that's moved through. And we've got like dark blues down there. Ooh, I have, I'm surprised. Maybe there could have been acid in that one, but there was definitely no acid in the blue. So, 
oh my gosh. But we can sort of tilt it now. I don't want to like spill things or move things too much, but actually, you know what we can do? We can just pick it up. Ooh, ooh, I see some browns down there. Okay, that's exciting. Okay. Ooh, this is gonna be fun. Okay, we need to add some acid, even though things have mostly struck. One, two, three tablespoons of white vinegar. Work this through. I was gonna add more water, but I don't even know if that's necessary. Oh, this is cool. All right, I, I do wanna add more water, mainly because it'll give a better shot for more color to absorb if the dyes can move and don't get trapped. And we still have the, like movement in here. Like the, the fiber takes up most of the space, but it's not as compressed, so that is good. But now I need a lid. I need a lid and we're gonna take this outside for a couple of days. Okay, we're outside. I'm filming some other videos but right now, but you can just ignore that. What is important is our pretty yarn. Isn't that green so pretty? Oh my goodness. And of course, Indy is barking. But the process that I'm doing here is what I would call a cool vat or cold process dyeing, where I set things up and I let it sit at room temperature or the weather is decent enough outside for at least overnight, so 12, 18 hours, up to a couple of days. And then I will heat set it. Now this allows me to process way more projects at once. I have a total of nine shoe boxes out here, and I set them all up over the course of, you know, a handful of hours. Whereas if I was waiting, to heat set these on the stove, then I wouldn't be able to get through as much as quickly. And so today is a Friday, and so it might be a Monday when I come back to heat set, or it could I could do it tomorrow. But I can start heat setting it, and yes, I still have to do things 30 minutes at a time, but the rhythm of that is easy to do, and I can edit or something in the meantime. And so it makes the processing of things easier. I can set things up closer together and that is just handy and helpful. I mean, while we're chatting, we may as well look at our fiber, right? Now, I would say cold process is adjacent to solar dyeing because sometimes some of these dye baths can actually get pretty warm being out in the sun. It is early October, but it's probably still high 60s, low 70s today. And at one point, uh, the dye bath that is right over here did get warm to the touch. And so we can get heat that way. But I still like to do a steam set at the end to give a good 30 minutes of heat, just in case. <laughs> there are some dye colors, and which we saw here with no acid, a lot of the color struck, but some of, I guess the green, so some of the yellow and a little bit of the blues didn't. And so those need a little bit more acid, maybe a little bit more time. And adding that heat step just helps make sure things are well set. Uh, because again, some things may just need that higher temperature and it's a step that honestly doesn't hurt and one that I like to do. Now, if I had a dedicated dye microwave, uh, and I know some dyers who have a microwave they use, then you could do things even faster because when I used to microwave yarn with food coloring, uh, I would microwave it for about two to six minutes using two minute intervals but I don't use acid dyes in my kitchen microwave that's a built-in microwave, but I would consider it if I got a standalone one that was dedicated for dyeing. And there, because you heat things up and it takes so long for them to cool off, you don't need to apply the heat as long, at least with food coloring, which is a type of acid dye with like more traditional acid dyes, uh, it might take more time. So that's just very worth considering. So Anyway, I will see you in a couple of days, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about it. And actually, it's funny, I think these containers over here are looking a little bit almost steamy, but I don't want to show it to you because I don't want to give any spoilers. <laughs> uh, but I'll see you in a couple days when we can remove the fiber. I'm not expecting a lot of changes, but 
I'm just really happy because you never know what's going to happen when you do something like this. And I'm thrilled. It was fun. I'm glad that things struck fast. But anyway, how many times am I going to say I'm going to see you in a couple days? No, I mean it for real because I'm about to turn off the camera. Yeah. <laughs> it is now first thing Monday morning and it is raining outside, which makes the top of this a little uh, grosser. Now things are actually quite cold right now. Yeah, very cold because it's in the low 50s right now. But I can say that even as recent as yesterday evening, the water was warm being outside because even though it's October, it was still getting in the even low 70s and the sun was warming things up. So, I mean, I guess I already put my fingers in without having gloves. <laughs> so let's go ahead and lift. Oh, all of that color is in there. Ooh, look at the depth. Oh, there's like a piece of glitter in here. That is so funny. All right, we are gonna, I just don't want it dripping as I quickly bring this over to a steamer basket so we can finish setting the color. Here we go. I'm gonna steam set this for at least 30 minutes. Cause part of me would say, maybe we wanna do a little bit more since the fiber's starting so cool. But on the flip side, the dye bath is clear and it's had some heat over the last uh, two and a half days. Now the reason why I like to do this heat setting step is some pigments need more heat and more acid to strike. And so things may sort of be sucked into the fiber, but then if we go to wash it, it could bleed. And so to help with that, the steam setting uh, can be really helpful. But what the cold process whole setup allows us to do is it allows the colors to strike slightly slower than maybe they would otherwise. And if my dye pots are both busy and I want to use up the dye and dye some yarn, doing it in the shoe box allows me to do that. So anyway, uh, we'll be back in around 30 minutes. The 30 minutes are up. Okay, and now I've got my tongs. I don't like, I'll turn off the steamer basket. I don't love moving fiber while it's wet. Not while it's wet. I don't, well, I don't love moving fiber while it's wet. I don't love moving it while it's hot. But we're gonna do it because I need to use this dye bath for other things. So I'm gonna set this aside to cool completely before we wash it. Let's wash our leave no dye behind fiber. I'm gonna add a drop of dish soap to a basin of cool water and sort of mix that up. And then I'm gonna take our cooled off fiber very slowly, carefully, deliberately adding it in. With a superwash fiber like this, you want to be slow and careful. It isn't as grippy, and so it would be really, really easy to pull apart. There is that piece of glitter. <laughs> so I'm gonna sort of grip it. Maybe we'll go ahead and lift. Oh gosh. It's like it almost drafts while it is wet which is nerve wracking to say the least. All right, I'm gonna fill the basin with water one more time, but we saw no bleeding, which is great. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> okay, but now I want to carefully remove this. And I'm not rubbing, I'm just gently squeezing out some of that liquid before I go put this in my spin dryer to remove as much of the liquid as I can. Here we are out of the spin dryer. We, I got one little pull like that. Uh, maybe there's another one down there. That can happen just because again, it's really easy for this to get snagged and come apart. Uh, normally fiber isn't easy to draft or anything while it's wet. <laughs> but since the superwash fibers are way less grippy because you can't felt it, uh, they come apart a little easier. But we'll fluff it up and make it pretty once we're dry. So I'll go hang it up to dry. The roving is now dry and you can see that we have a one little pull there. And I think, ooh, that's all in one piece. Where, okay, you are completely separate. Oh, but this actually isn't so bad. Uh, I don't need to fluff this fiber up at all because it is like fluffy already. It isn't really, 
compressed on itself like sometimes fiber can get. Okay, we have one other little pull here, but that's still attached. So that is good, but eek. I mean, I need to move the camera, but we're looking good. I'm actually a huge fan of the pops of rust that we have here. And then of course the broken blue and green tones. This is going to spin up really fun. Now we almost can visualize a little bit what the rust tones will do in spun yarn by that piece that came off. So those rust areas are pretty short and as you draft it'll move relative to the other colors and sort of blend into the fiber in a really fun way. That's the fun thing about fiber is that having a splotch can easily be blended out um, or just add a little bit more dimension to the overall yarn. I don't think I've ever dyed roving in a shoebox like this. And I just popped that little piece right here. But I'm definitely interested in doing that again. I think that it worked really well. It's a way I could process more. And by starting with the cold process, I'm glad that we still have a lot of variation in the fiber, but starting with a cold process is a little bit less, quote, scary. And I only get scary because I get worried about felting. And if it's hot, then needing to remove it, it would be hard for me to do a lot of fiber all at once. Oh my goodness, just look at the way these colors come together. Now, I think that you could get fun, pretty watercolory effects on the fiber without having a random mixture of colors that break. And I want to try this technique again on maybe non-superwash fiber or superwash fiber again and try to get something more variegated on purpose. But I think that because if I was doing this immersion in a steam pan, I would want to let it cool completely before removing it from the pan. Uh, unlike yarn, I don't remove it and set it aside to cool because I worry about felting by moving it that much, which means that the pan is still full until it dries. Uh, I've had questions about whether or not I would consider ever doing roving as a mystery feature for one of the mystery holidays or events that I do. and. I haven't considered that because I don't know about my ability to scale up the dyeing of fiber, but this concept and technique is something I think I could scale up in a way that I could do it with my small batch equipment that I have at my home. So anyway, I am very inspired and intrigued and oh my gosh, but the colors in here are so pretty and I'm just amazed and happy. And that amazement is because I thought that I was gonna have a little bit of brown and then a lot of a bluish color. I didn't think we would have this much dimension in here and so I was pleasantly surprised. And honestly, that's the fun thing about Leave No Dye Behind. Why don't we check out the other side and while I have your attention, subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss a new video. And while you're at it, uh, go and check out the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. There usually isn't a lot of roving in the shop that tends to sell out pretty quickly, but my shop is filled with hand dyed yarn that's been featured in my videos, which makes it really unique. All the yarn is labeled with the video title and date, Mo most of them are labeled with the date uh, that the video was or will be published. So that way you can go and watch the video while you use the yarn and I think that that's really unique and a lot of fun. You'll have a link to my shop down in the video description. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and thank you so much for watching.